this week's drive, we delay Ferrari's big red hope. Watch the start of a new season. Go straight to the scene of the crash. And see what's being done about safety. All this and more in this week's Drive. The debut of Ferrari's new Formula One car has been delayed just days before it was due to race for the first time. Earlier this month, Ferrari team principal Jean Tot said the 2003 GA was set to debut at the San Marino Grand Prix at Imola. But a week before the race, the team made the shock disclosure that the car wouldn't be ready to race after all. The team attempted to forestall conjecture about the new car by saying simply that it was experiencing the normal teething problems of a young car and therefore it was decided not to take any unnecessary risks by racing it prematurely. Drivers Michael Schumacher and Rubens Barrichello were at the Mugello track a week before the Imola round to test the new car. The testing sessions seemed to go well, but rain on Thursday and Friday restricted the program. Ferrari's had a disastrous start to the season. The team has been running a revised version of last year's F2002 this year and finished off the podium for the first time in 54 races at the start of the year. Ferrari's delay comes after news that McLaren's new contender is behind schedule two. South African Rory Byrne is Ferrari's designer and he's worked closely with Schumacher in each of his five world championship wins. Rubens Barrichello has finally found a head and neck support that he's comfortable with. No, it's a definite improvement. It's the question mark by how much. And that's something we only would find out if it would be here and now with an old car uh, at the same time. We have seen uh, some indication, but uh, it's not 100% clear what actually is the gap. Schumacher's loyal sidekick and number two wingman Barrichello has had equally appalling luck in the early stages of this year crashing twice and retiring once in the first three races, and all in a car which was supremely reliable last year, winning 15 of the 17 rounds. But now that the Grand Prix season has reached Europe, the team and its many supporters are hoping that Bern, Badur and Massa will be able to get on top of the new car's problems and deliver race wins and world championship points. Basically, that's, that's all. Uh, I, I really look forward to, to the European Grand Prix, coming there with a new car and uh, hopefully get a good result in. The new car has been consistently faster than the 2002 in testing, but there were indications that it was occasionally unreliable. Schumacher completed a total of 50 laps at Mugello, with a best of 1 minute 21.287 seconds. Barrichello covered 63 laps, four on the short version of the track, with the quickest of 1 minute 21.210 seconds. The two test drivers, Luca Badur and Felipe Massé, have clocked up many more testing laps of the new design at the factory's private test track of Fiorano. Both race drivers like it too. Altogether, the 2003 is, is a better car. Uh, so it's nice to drive and it, uh, it was my first time in Barcelona last, uh, last month and uh, I mean, right now it feels even better. So, I mean, it's, it's a lot of uh, emotions going on because you want to take it because it's a better car. But both Rubens and Michael will have to wait just a little longer to drive the new car in competition. Three weeks before the season opener of the DTM Touring Car Championship for 2003 at Hockenheim, Abt Audi and Opel showed the 2003 versions of the Audi TTR and Opel Astra V8 Coupe. Mercedes-Benz also unveiled their 2003 CLK DTM Challenger. Reigning champion Frenchman Laurent Aiello faces the new season brimming with confidence. My target is uh, not to defend the title but to keep it. Bernd Schneider was fastest on the day on the Grand Prix track, outpacing his teammate Jean Alesi by a third of a second. 
Japanese driver Katsutomo Kanishi did 74 laps, but was two and a half seconds slower than Schneider, and 10th fastest on the day. Schneider did 79 laps, and Alesi completed 75. Thomas Jager took his Mercedes-Benz round the track 75 times and ended the day fifth fastest, a second off the pace, but with valuable data for the team's engineers. Aiello's DTM crown isn't his first success. In 1998, he won the Le Mans 24 hours, and a year later, he became British touring car champion. Matthias Ekstrom was fourth in his Audi TTR, only two tenths down on Alesi. Probably the, the most, most difficult thing about defending the title is just to keep the motivation, the motivation for everybody in the team and uh, to work hard. Definitely the app team has made uh, big efforts during the winter, uh, try to improve the car and uh, because this is also something important, you know, not to stay with your, uh, the car which we, you won the championship, it's also to, to try to improve it. Uh, last year I was third in the championship and uh, up to the end I was uh, fighting for second place and uh, I had uh, a lot of uh, good uh, races last year and I want to continue in that way and uh, to win a championship it's very difficult but I will do my very best to, to, to fight for it. Ex-Formula One star Jean Alesi has shown that he still has the pace to mix it with the best in the class. For 2003, DTM races have been increased to 160 kilometers from 100 and must now include two pit stops with compulsory tire changes. Changes to racing aren't limited to Formula One, it seems. It was a clean start to the 499-mile, 188-lap NASCAR race at Talladega in Alabama. But just like last week, it wouldn't stay orderly for long. Running fourth, cut down a tire, treble, turn one. Hard. Just four laps into the race, there was a multi-car accident. 27 cars were involved in the wreck that started when the number 12 car of Ryan Newman spun out with a cut tire. In a replay from Rusty Wallace's car, the bad tyre from Newman's car is seen as it flies over the wall. Ryan Newman's car was heavily damaged and was carted off the track. It's ripped right off of that car. It wasn't the right rear, it must have been the left rear that he had a problem with. On lap 83, Michael Waltrip spun out, and that resulted in a caution flag. Waltrip radioed to his crew and said that he was squeezed between two cars and that the crash was not his fault. I believe I saw Jeremy Mayfield, the pole sitter there. You see Kyle Petty. That's all I could do. I got squeezed out. It wasn't my fault. Later in the race, Robbie Gordon left his pit with a fuel vapor vent can still inserted into the tank. And certainly that was someone's fault. With five laps to go, Dale Earnhardt Jr., son of the late seven times NASCAR champion, made a pass and moved from fourth place into the lead. He's got to run. Kenza tried to close him off. That's going to be borderline, guys. That's going to be borderline. There's Harvick lined up behind Jr. Then, with just two laps to go, Jimmy Johnson spun out. Amazingly, no other cars ran into him. This will be the race right here. Go remember the start finish line is way down headed into turn one. It's not in the center of the trial. You can't do it, Larry. You can't make it. You can't get, you're not going to pull out and pass him with a second. Dale Earnhardt Jr. went on to win his fourth successive victory at the Talladega track. That equaled the record for consecutive wins on the same track set by Bill Elliott in 1985 and 86. The 2003 Outdoor Trials World Championship got underway in Bangor in Ireland. After missing out in the indoor series, reigning outdoor champion Dougie Lamkin was looking for a victory in the British leg. Lamkin finished second on day one, but picked up eight penalty points on the second, winning by five points. Lamkin therefore picked up 37 World Championship points for his second and first place finishes, which takes him to the top of the standings. Takahisa Fujinami took victory on the opening day of the season, picking up 14 penalties over two laps of the 15-section course, compared to Lampkin's 17. 
The Japanese Honda rider finished fourth on day two, picking up 33 world championship points to go second in the standings. Third in the standings is Spaniard Adam Raga, the current indoor world champion. He took 23 penalty points and third on Saturday, but light rain made for an increasingly difficult course on Sunday, and Raga finished the day in fifth place. Following a disappointing first day in which he ended up a lonely eighth place, Mark Frischer bounced back on Sunday, taking second. The Spaniard finished five points behind his Montessa teammate Lampkin with 27 penalty points and moved into fourth place in the overall standings. Another Spaniard, Albert Cabastani, would finish in third place on the Sunday. But it was an important performance for Cabastani of the beta team, whose title hopes took an early knock on Saturday when he finished seventh. Eventually, he claimed fifth place in the championship. Lamkin will continue his title defence in Ettelbrook in Luxembourg. In the rarefied world of Formula One, having as little air resistance as possible is paramount. Racing cars are sleek, small and light so that the engine can propel them as fast as possible. But many, many drivers have been killed or injured because their cars were too fragile and offered little or no protection when crashes occurred. Some road cars now offer more sophisticated safety features than anything on the racetrack. When the worst comes to the worst, the design must also be able to stand up to a lot. Increasingly, that applies to the impact of side-on collisions. Stringent load tests on the side panels check the structural stability of the car. The monocoque must be able to withstand an impact of 12 meters per second without any damage at all. That's only about 43 kilometers an hour, but because this kind of impact can exert an enormous force on the driver, flexibility is required as well as structural stability. A side collision is, of course, a particularly tricky situation. The driver's head will smash with full force onto the edge of the monocoque. This frame has been developed to protect the head and to dampen the impact, so the driver's head is much better protected. The side impact collision also creates problems for road car engineers. In carefully monitored tests, they try to find out exactly which forces are applied when, and especially where. A side collision is particularly dangerous because there is no adequate crumpel zone. That is why the manufacturers now install airbags from the door area to protect the driver's chest and also from the roof to protect the driver's head. The side airbags in normal cars are designed to protect against dangerous side collisions. They have to trigger much faster than front airbags in just one quarter of the time because there is no crumple zone to progressively absorb the energy of a collision at the side. It's a question of thousandths of a second. The systems must detect the force of the impact and deploy the airbag. This precision work can only be handled and guaranteed with state-of-the-art computer technology, electronics and constant system diagnostics checks. Mistakes would be unforgivable. An airbag is essentially an explosive or pyrotechnic device, and having things like that scattered around the confined space of a car's interior requires very strong guarantees that they won't trigger accidentally, for example, when the car hits a pothole or if a door is slammed. Safety and stability of the devices must also be guaranteed through to the end of a vehicle's life, no matter how long and rugged that may be. And there are implications for maintenance and recycling technicians too. But all airbag systems are designed to work in conjunction with a safety belt to maintain the passenger in the correct position in the seat. Many cars now have pre-tensioner devices to lock the belt and therefore restrain the occupant a split second before the airbag is triggered. An important factor is not only how fast the airbag is deployed, but also when. For instance, sensors in the seat can evaluate the weight of the occupant and register the seat's position in relation to the dashboard of the car. With this information, intelligent airbag systems can control which airbag is triggered, when and how strongly. The basic system is constantly evolving and being improved. Many top-end road cars now have eight or ten airbags to protect the occupants. Tremendous progress has been made in terms of materials. The most intriguing questions are, 
How do the materials react to deformation? How much energy can they absorb? When do they become brittle or break? Could they be dangerous to the car's occupants? Kevlar and carbon fiber compounds are the modern state-of-the-art materials. They are stable, light, strong, and absorb impact energy better than aluminium. With aluminium, we see a curve which oscillates up and down and is not very regular. With carbon fiber, on the other hand, we get a very regular curve. The production of carbon fiber parts is very expensive. In this autoclave, a kind of giant oven, the individual fibers are baked into a densely structured mat. A high-tech material that is much stronger and half the weight of aluminium. And this material can perform the trick of combining the principal demands of Formula One, speed with safety. To a more far-sighted technology now, Australia, the wide brown land down under, has hosted various solar-powered races, and the most recent, Sunrace 2003, was from the city of Adelaide to Sydney's Olympic Park, via Melbourne and the nation's capital, Canberra. The event, now in its seventh year, is a 10-day, 2,300-kilometre challenge for sustainable energy vehicles, which includes solar and hybrid petrol-electric power. Sunrise programs engage and encourage young people in the pursuit of technological excellence. These are the scientists and engineers of the future who will take these sustainable technologies to the marketplace. The event's objectives are to create community, corporate and government awareness of sustainable technologies and greenhouse issues, to promote research, development and implementation of sustainable technologies, and to encourage young people to pursue careers in sustainable technology disciplines. The Blue International Eagle was built by a local technical college. The body shape was perfected using 3D virtual reality, real-time computer designing. The result is a coefficient of drag of just 0.12, about a third of most conventional road-going cars. The Chisholm College has a proud history of competition in similar events, including the outright win in the 1999 World Solar Cycle Challenge. This young spectator got a lot closer than he expected. Try that with Michael Schumacher's Ferrari. The Bush Ranger is from the city of Orange, which explains the color. Honda's Insight and the Toyota Prius are commercially available hybrid petrol-electric vehicles. A small petrol engine charges a bank of batteries that drive the car most of the time. The engine only runs to top up the batteries or to help get up hills. Melbourne's new museum was the backdrop for the start of the leg from the world's most southerly city of over a million people. The museum featured an exhibition about space and particularly about Mars. This has a connection with the first car away, Aurora, as some of the solar cells used on the Aurora RMOT 101 are leftovers from the Mars lander program. The Sunrace technical rules place restrictions on solar power, capped at 1200 watts, and on battery size to be half of that allowed in the World Solar Challenge. Grey skies never cleared and were made worse by smoke from bushfires that ravaged that part of Australia. Reported solar power never exceeded 350 watts compared to the 1200 that would be achieved in clear sunlight. Aurora's arch rival, SunSwift 2, from the University of New South Wales, has 4,000 solar cells in nine panels, producing 164 volts at the motor, which drives the rear wheel. The technology may be top-notch, but the turning circle isn't up to much. By the time the event reached Sydney, Aurora was declared the winner, with SunSwift third. SunSwift 2 had new electronics, aerodynamic wheel spats, and improved carbon fiber wheels to cut both aerodynamic drag and overall weight. The Blue International Eagle team have won mileage marathons and the Australian Fuel Challenge. They took the hybrid class in a 24-hour pedal car race, and in Sunrace, the team won the ultralight electric vehicle class in 2001, the most practical electric vehicle, and finished third overall. Last year, the Eagle team won the ultralight class and came second this year. Bush Ranger 2 uses a shell from the Eagle team, but is quite different underneath. 
It's the brainchild of just one man, John Didusco, who designed, built and raced the original Bush Ranger for several years, until it was simply outclassed. He claimed fifth overall this year. Looking a little like a three-wheeled Formula racing car, the Williama High School entry from the mining town of Broken Hill finished fourth overall. Students from the school did all the work on the battery-powered car, including the driving, and have the experience of previous events, plus working models of solar-powered cars and entries in events like the 24-hour pedal car race on which to draw. Looking very similar is another high school effort from Mitchell Secondary College in the inland city of Wodonga. They placed sixth overall. Much more comfortable was the Honda Insight, entered by the local Greenfleet initiative. Not being a prototype, it wasn't classified in the results. Similarly, the Toyota Prius wasn't classified either, although having both production cars along demonstrated that the motor industry is taking steps to lessen dependence on fossil fuels, even if the true free energy car might be a while off yet. Electric vehicle technology which can be used is here and now. This electric moped, which can cover 40 kilometers before the battery needs recharging, has got the go-ahead for use throughout the European Union. It really carries about four times the power in terms of battery capacity, and it has a motor that's around four to five times more powerful. So in terms of hill climbing, uh, you'll find the Ego Cycle to be able to perform like a gas-powered motor, you know, moped, uh, and it'll also perhaps three times or four times the range of an electric bicycle. The bike comes flat-packed from the factory in the United States. The bike is easy to put together and operate and should appeal even to people with no previous experience of motorbikes or mopeds. But the greatest danger of Ego Cycle is probably to pedestrians who don't hear it coming. Running on battery power alone, it's virtually silent. We're looking at a, a number of different sectors. I mean, urban commuters, an obvious one, where rather than being at the bus stop and uh, catching the train for a short trip, this is fine. We're looking at older people that just want to pop into town to get their shopping, possibly. And we're looking at university campuses where people live four or five miles out, have to get in every day. And we think that is a pretty good market area as well. It packs a much heftier punch than other electric bikes. It has five times the power of conventional electric cycles and can tackle journeys uphill or on the flat. With just a twist of the hand throttle and off you go. No clutch or foot pedals to worry about. A fully charged battery will take you about 40 kilometers and haul a trailer load of 45 kilos. Ideal for short stop-start journeys around town, the bike will also do 26 kilometers an hour up a 15% gradient. We've been through the process of uh, obtaining European whole vehicle type approval. It means throughout the whole of the EEC, this is street legal. It can go on the road anywhere in that area. And because of all the safety things we've had to go for, it's really safe anywhere in the world, to be honest. And when you get back home, it's just a question of powering up the battery. And in three to five hours, you're off again. EgoCycle is expected to retail for around 1,200 pounds in the UK and it could soon be a familiar but quiet sight on the world's high streets. So, whether you're mud-plugging in Bangor or building the latest technology for tomorrow, so you stay on track and up to speed, make sure you catch next week's Drive.